I never could have started the podcast without Instagram as it was at the time, not because of uh, any type of growth or that it rewarded me with like some kind of, you know, phenomenal following, mm -hmm. but because the actual community there was genuinely strong, mm -hmm. giving, curious, and it shared values with me. Welcome to New Watermark Photography Podcast, an international offering of Simarca de Agua, a podcast for professionals and enthusiasts to connect and share their stories. I'm Jessica Duque, food photographer and your host. This podcast is brought to you by Sigma, sigmabenelux.com Soho, Brand Studio whiteybackdrops.com Tether Tools Food Media House Photo Fleets In this episode, I had the pleasure of interviewing Becky Hadid, a multi-talented creative force. She's a renowned photographer, food blogger, and the host of the acclaimed podcast, The Story Recipe. Becky's inspiring journey took her from wedding photography to her true passion for food photography and blogging. But it was her true venture into podcasting that truly defined her. With the story recipe, she embarked on a mission to receive, honor, and share food stories from around the world. During our conversation, we explore Becky's creative process and the challenges she faced. She briefly shared a deeply personal experience of being hacked Despite the adversity, Becky's resilience shines through as she generously provides resources on her website to support other creatives facing similar obstacles. Becky is not only a talented storyteller, but also a cultural ambassador who celebrates the power of food to connect people and preserve traditions. This podcast goes beyond photography. It is about sharing the stories behind the food. This is No Watermark Photography Podcast. Welcome, Becky Hadid. Okay, welcome to the No Watermark Photography Podcast. We have here Becky Hadid. She's the creator of the Story Recipe Podcast. Sorry, yep, it is like you a, got it. <laughs> difficult to say, but uh, I'm so happy to have you here. Hello, Becky. How are you? I am really honored to have you here, Jessica. You were one of my most popular guests and by far one of um, my family's favorite recipes ever. You're Venezuelan. Arepas. Oh, so, wow. Yes. With the shredded uh, chicken and avocado. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Perfect combination, everybody. Like if yeah. you if you haven't heard that episode, please go there. I'm going to leave all the information of Becky here in the, the, on the description box and you can find her on Instagram, on uh, Spotify and all the major platforms uh, where you can hear her podcast. But so, I've appreciated your friendship in the meantime, because I think we think very similarly about things. And so yeah. I'm I'm thankful for your friendship. I also yeah, want to say same, 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 same here. Okay, mm -hmm. Vicky, for the audience, uh, what is your background, your education, your upbringing, mm -hmm. occupation? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Okay. So I grew up um, in Maryland, a suburb of DC, you know, a hop, skip and jump away from DC. Um, it's a it's an environment that values um, success and uh a lot of what people call type A personalities. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of free time. It's not it's not a laid back uh, <laughs> environment that I grew up in. Um, I took school really seriously. It was probably too much of my identity. Had to have an A all the time. Um, mm -hmm. In college, I double majored in math and English. Wow. Um, And uh, when I and I also took the classes that I needed, some of them at the graduate level, to teach math. Um, when I graduated, which is what I did. I went right into teaching math. And to be honest with you, if there was anything that I think I was really born to do, it's to teach. I love being in front of a classroom. I love it. I just, I love taking things and breaking it down into um, step-by-step chunks of thinking that make sense to me. I love interacting with the class. Like there's a, there's a magic that happens when there's a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. I love the adrenaline, um, that I got off of it. And I loved, um, I loved a lot of things, but I just unexpectedly one day I went to work 
um, went to a routine sonogram and ended up in the hospital mm -hmm. uh, five months before my first son was born. So I was only four months pregnant and uh, stayed in the hospital for a long time, had him really early. Um, he was sick. Uh, I was going to go back in the fall, um, but didn't because he was sick. And then I got pregnant a second time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, that time I was um, sick uh, even earlier. I was okay. on bed rest really, really early, spent a lot of time again in the hospital. And he was, so I wasn't sick so much as my body just always wants to have the baby. Like mm -hmm. if you hook me up to a monitor, I'm just constantly having contractions wow. um, from almost immediately um, in pregnancy. So anyhow, uh, my second was very, very ill. He was, um, transported to Johns Hopkins hospital the night he was born. Um, and his recovery took, um, most of a year. Um, mm -hmm. so he, he wasn't in the hospital that whole time, but I was just caring for them. My husband had started a business. He owns a software company mm -hmm. and uh, he was super, super busy. I was just caring for them. And so I kind of just didn't go back to teaching. Um, if I'm being totally honest, I regret that. I don't think that was the best choice for me, but it was something that that's just where I ended up. And uh, I just, it's it's not the worst thing to happen to a person, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't go back, um, was kind of helping my husband a little bit, wasn't super that into it. And then my sister-in-law, well, my brother-in-law started dating a woman who was an incredible photographer. Mm -hmm. And about the same time, my third child, so my first two kids are biological and my second two are adopted. My third child came home and my older brother, who has the gift of gift giving, was so excited for me. He gave me um, an SLR camera. It was like their old one. And because my brother-in-law was dated, dating this really talented photographer, I was just like, I know what this camera can do and I am going to figure it out. And so at night when I would feed my baby, I was like reading the manual from beginning to end, finding every article or book. I love the library. I'm constantly at the library finding every book that's you know, nobody learns photography from books anymore, but I did. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, looking things up um, and just practicing, practicing, practicing during the day. So a few months later, um, my actually, I guess my my third was nine. So it was like nine months. And then um, my brother-in-law married this woman. Her name's Susie. She moved up to the DC area where I was. And within a couple of weeks, I just said, do you mind maybe just mentoring me in photography? Cause I really like it and your stuff is gorgeous. So she came over and, um, it was actually food that I was photographing, which is funny because only because that was like what I had around. Um, and because I have always loved to cook and I've always loved food. And, uh, she just looked at it. She gave me a couple tips and she said, honestly, you're ready to start a business. Like you just, you have a talent for this. And, uh, I think you should go for it, which PS is her personality. I would hold myself back. I didn't mm -hmm. see it that way, but she really encouraged me. So anyhow, at the time I had three very young kids, um, and we knew we were going to adopt a fourth and my husband was working constantly, uh, as a, as a software business owner, like those years of starting mm -hmm. are a lot. And I just felt like I can't start a business right now. Also, I also didn't feel like that was something I was super gifted in. And, uh, so I just went to her and I said, you have this photography business. You're trying to move it up here. How about if we work together? And, uh, I don't know why she said yes. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, I don't understand that because she barely knew me, but she did. And we started uh, working together as wedding photographers. We worked together for nine years. Um, the DC market's an amazing market to do wedding mm -hmm. photography in because um, it's really high end. You can make a lot. You can make a lot of money, and uh, and it's also. I mean, I shot at the National Cathedral multiple times, which is just an amazing experience. I shot. Um, my husband and I were just on the National Mall in D.C. Um, Saturday night for a date for his birthday. And I was remembering this day. It was a January day. It was 17 degrees out. That's very cold. That's mm -hmm. Fahrenheit. It was very, very cold out. We were doing a sunrise January shoot um, at the Lincoln Memorial. And my husband, God bless him, came with me 
So I could just shoot. We would get the couple back in the car, warm up, go shoot some more. And I had this experience where it was me and the couple and just us at sunrise in the Lincoln Memorial. Gorgeous photos, just them in front of the reflecting pool with the Washington Monument in the back. I mean, just this amazing, I could take amazing photos, you know, yeah. where I was and you know, I just, I, I, I loved it. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I especially loved working with my sister-in-law. We're very, very close. We still get together once a week, um, even though we don't work together anymore. Um, and again, like a classroom, there was a lot of taking charge that you have mm -hmm. to do on a wedding day, but in a super diplomatic way that stays out of the way. Um, it allows the story to unfold in front of you, but there's times where everybody needs to get in the family photo and you need to make it happen in two minutes, yes. you know? And uh, there was so much systemizing that we had to do um work in advance to make the wedding day and it's just you know we felt like we delivered a great experience to our clients um we were super you know proud of the photographs we delivered them so much adrenaline like you are all in you have little kids you know it's just exhausting yes. but i mean you get to a wedding day and your mind is just every second you're taking the best photo you can well, staying out of the way, I, it was just, it was great. It was totally consuming and I like work that's consuming. Yes. Um, so it was wonderful. I loved it. I loved it. And then, uh, yeah, like you said, my, um, my oldest, you know, we did that for like almost nine years mm -hmm. uh, or maybe a little more than nine years. And then my oldest was starting high school and it was perfect working weekends when the kids were young, because my husband, again, I was not available <laughs> for 12 mm -hmm. or 14 or 16 hours that day. It was all him. And so that's such a great thing for kids and their dad. Uh, if, if their mom's like the primary caretaker to have that, like, it's just, I was totally out of the picture. I wasn't trying to control anything. I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to say how it had to be done. They were just experiencing my husband's personality full on, yeah. which is a bonding, very different bonding. parenting person. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, uh, and so it was a great thing because I kind of got a taste of his world a little bit. He got a taste of my world a little bit. And that yes. was really, really, I think good, um, for our kids. I think it was good for our marriage. I think it kept me sane. I don't think I would have been sane otherwise. Um, during the week I'm trying to build a business. Like I got to do that, build something, which again, I'd love to do, but the weekends are exhausting. And once my oldest started high school, by that point, my younger kids were starting sports and stuff. And I just wanted to be available on yes. the weekends. It was just, it, it was just, that was all there is to it. And uh, so I stopped, I stopped. And as I was stopping, it was kind of like a transition as of a year or so, because it takes, you know, you book weddings so far in advance here, at least here mm -hmm. in the DC area. Again, they're a big deal. And uh, so as, as we were kind of transitioning out, I just started going back to taking photos of food because that's always been very satisfying to me. Like food is so meaningful to me for many reasons. Yes. And, uh, brands started to reach out to me a little bit. Listen, nothing, you know, will you take photos for free was basically what they were reaching out to me saying. So I don't want to like, you know, make it seem like I had some burgeoning career or anything. But mm. the point was I had an experience running a photography business with my sister-in-law. She had taught me so much about entrepreneurship. It seemed like the next natural step, but I just couldn't get excited about it. I couldn't get excited about it. And so that is where, um, I decided to do something that celebrated, uh, the deeper meaning of food, which is the way it connects us to generations past, the way it connects us to our culture, yes. the way it connects us to each other, the way it connects us to our religions, our celebrations, our seasons, all of these things. And uh, my podcast is just a celebration of all of that. Mm -hmm. It's only a little bit about food. <laughs> it's mostly um, about people's lives and stories. <laughs> yes, but it's all connected. It is all, all connected. connected. That's the key. It, yeah. You got it. You nailed it. Yeah. I remember when you approached me and I, I remember mm. at, at the time I was doing a photo of a recipe that I like so much mm. uh, from Indonesia. It, mm. I don't know if I pronounce it well. I'm sorry, mm. but it's called uh, Rendang Pangam. So mm. I made it. It's like a beef stew with a mm -hmm. coconut uh, milk and it has some, you know, spicy, you know, touches and mm. some uh, krupuk you know, some mm. crackers made of uh, uh, shrimps, I think, and mm. rice. Oh, And then I made that photo and you uh, 
you ask me, uh, what is the reason of this photo? Why do you like so much uh, about food and this oh, and did that? I? <laughs> so I remember and I was like, well, I'm a food photographer. I go to mm -hmm. restaurants basically every day and I have to photograph stories. And every mm -hmm. time I go to a, a restaurant, it's normally like a family restaurant mm -hmm. and they have their own recipes and they are mm -hmm. so proud to share it with mm. you not to share the recipe but to share the dish with you yes because, you know this is something that they protect so much their yes. traditions they can give you a try but they are not gonna give you the secret <laughs> that's the, that's the thing yeah and then i have tried like different uh rendan pangang from different restaurants and mm. i know each dish has their own story, their own tradition mm -hmm. and right that's the reason i was invited to you to your pro to your podcast yeah. sorry And I told you, maybe I can talk about arepas because that is our, you know, yes, part wherever we go. Yes, your culinary calling card. I still exactly. remember what you said. <laughs> It's been two years. Your culinary calling card. And I thought, exactly. oh, exactly. So that is an, a great our phrase. introduction to all the cultures. And, and mm -hmm. I, I heard from a chef uh, on TV, it's a Venezuelan chef. Mm -hmm. And then he said, on the 24th of December, We made mm. the whole world to taste ayaka. Ayaka is another traditional dish mm. that is so difficult for us to explain, but it, it is like a tamale from Mexico. So mm. it, ha it's a, it has a combination of uh, meat and chicken and this and that. Mm. And it's traditional uh, a Venezuelan dish for December. Mm. And then he said, we because we are everywhere, because mm. of the diaspora, because of the yeah. situation our country is living in right now, we made the whole world eat ayakas on the 24th of December. And yeah, you're making beautiful. me so hungry. It is beautiful. <laughs> it is beautiful. It is. It is. Yeah. I'm working on an episode this week from um uh immigrant from Lebanon. And yes. she said you would just buy um she gave me a recipe for something called spoof, which is a turmeric cake. And she yes. said, you know, in Lebanon, we would just buy this. It wouldn't even be a second thought. But we've like carefully found and meticulously refined this recipe so we can make it here as a way to represent our country. Yes. She's like, you know, a lot of not great stuff is in the news. This is only based on a very narrow part of history that we're living in, but Lebanon has such a beautiful history, mm -hmm. such a deep culture, and we want to share that with the world. And this is this is how we do it, you know? Yes. And um, I thought that was really beautiful that it wasn't just something that had been passed down, but they've actually developed this specifically mm -hmm. to say, um, this is something that, We just, you know, just take it for granted in Lebanon. Yes. And probably mm. the audience is asking, why are we talking about recipes and a podcast mm. about recipes? <laughs> so here's the thing. I mm. invited Becky to this episode mm. because I wanted to talk about how to find your niche as a photographer. In this case, mm -hmm. Be uh, Becky was a wedding photographer first. Then she found her passion for food and for photographing stories and for telling stories and sharing stories. And now she's fully focused on her podcast what are you now tell us about it like as a yes. photographer as a podcaster mm. where is Becky right now well it's a really good question and it's one that makes me sad to talk about to be totally honest with you but um what I have realized is that photography ushered me in to mm -hmm. this um venture whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it uh But now I am, I've had to make a choice, I think, to think of myself as a photographer mm -hmm. or to think of myself as um, a podcaster. And it's actually for me broader than being a podcaster. I think for me, it is my job to receive, honor, and share stories. Yes. Um, I don't have a very exciting story to share, but a lot of people do. And mm -hmm. I, I'm not concerned with that, whether that person has a large platform or not. Yes. Um, and I feel that it is my, I, I just feel like it's something that I'm good at and it's something that I love to do. And it's something that my passion only grows for, which is to receive honor and share these stories. Mm -hmm. And photography used to help me do that. Um, when I started on Instagram, it was a thriving platform yes. and 
whatever you posted would be shared and people could find these stories through the photography. And I literally felt like to take a photo, you know, I asked so many questions. I don't, you know, if you remember about the colors you associate with this dish and the, uh, the, the botanicals you associate with the dish or, mm -hmm. you know, so many little things. So I could include even like symbolism in the photos, you know, yes. and I really wanted them to tell the story, but, uh, Instagram, who has a right to do this, uh, yes. has changed their algorithm so massively. And before that I was hacked, uh, right at the height of like my growth. And it, it just, it just, it just, um, it destroyed the momentum that I had. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so because of that, now what I need, um, I'm, I'm, I'm using Google and SEO as my main growth tactic because they give you rule, like, there's rules you have to play by and they explain mm -hmm. the rules to you. And yes. if you follow the rules, you can grow. It's very simple. It, yes. It's not easy, but it's simple. And uh, they're committed to that. They are committed to giving your product mm -hmm. to the world if it's a good product and if you sell it well and they tell yes. you how to sell it. And so um, what that means is I need a few photos for every post. They don't need to be very artistic. They need to be something that in a one by one square, mm -hmm. you can clearly see what the recipe is. That's yes. what's making people click. Yes. And so uh, I have become very um, hard on myself because once I start to photograph, it's very difficult for me to stop. Mm -hmm. I am curious and I love to try to create beautiful things and I love to play with the light and I love to tell a story uh, visually. And so once I start to photograph, it's hard for me to stop, but I've had to be very firm with myself and say, this is no longer the path for growth for you. And if mm -hmm. I, if you really believe Becky, <laughs> I talk sternly to myself, if you really believe that your job here is to uh, receive honor and share stories, then you need to be putting your time into something else that's yes. going to allow you to do that. And so uh, I do still take photos. I have a, a Lebanese cake downstairs mm -hmm. cooling and I will take photos of it this afternoon, but, um, I will set a timer and I will need to be done, uh, in a short amount of time. Fortunately, because of my wedding photography background, I am really good mm -hmm. <laughs> at, uh, taking a lot of photos under pressure and, yes. uh, taking a lot of variety. Yes. Um, but I am a photographer at heart. Yes. But, and I'm getting really into landscape photography. That's a whole different thing just as mm -hmm. a hobby. It's a whole new thing to learn, but it's not serving my purposes anymore um, okay. to take the photos I like to take. And about that, mm. can you describe a little bit how is your process? Like okay, mm. when you choose your guest and mm -hmm. you find that story like fascinating and that mm -hmm. person shared the recipe with you, mm -hmm. okay, time frame from mm. interview, preparations, shooting, mm. how long it takes you in total? Mm. That just means getting a couple really good, clear shots of what the recipe is. So in terms of the process, um, uh, so on Monday, I have like a little reminder to place the order mm -hmm. for anything that I need to make the dish. If I need to do anything in advance on Tuesday, I do that. And then Wednesday. So most of the dishes that people give me aren't desserts. Most of them are actually meals. They're not photogenic, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I enjoy that challenge, but they're not. But um, I get home from picking up my son at 3 p.m. Yes. And my family, we eat really early because I have so many kids in sports and everything. It's either before or after. So uh, we eat by 5 p.m. And that mm -hmm. is how long I give myself to make and to photograph the dish, including any ingredient shots. Okay. And now, a word from our sponsor. I want to tell you about Food Media House, a creative powerhouse that will transform your brand with unique and bold visuals. With experience in photography and creative direction, they will captivate your audience and bring your vision to life. From recipes to food styling, they create content for social, web, and marketing campaigns with irresistible visuals. Based in Los Angeles, they collaborate remotely with brands from around the world. Contact now, foodmediahouse.com. Back to the episode. Okay. Two-hour stops? Yeah, like, uh, that's it. That's it? That's it. 
That's it. And again, I have a very, so I have to shout out to your backdrop store. (laughs) (laughs) I love your backdrops, Jessica. And (laughs) they really helped me with this because I will tell people, uh, and again, I, I know this from wedding photography, when you had 10 minutes to take all of your bride and groom photographs, there's a couple of key things that allow you to get a lot quickly. And one of the things is you need variety. You can't just keep taking the same shot. So I will often grab two or even three of your backdrops, line them up in the (laughs) different types of light that I want. Um, I'll take last Friday, for example. I photographed, oh, I photographed a Venezuelan dish. Oh, wow. Yeah. You can tell me how to pronounce it. Pabellon Criolla? Pabellon Criollo. (laughs) Pabellon Criollo. Yeah, Okay. (laughs) Criollo, right? Okay. And um, so I grabbed, I wanted, it's it's not a very colorful dish, but I wanted something really colorful to yes. showcase like the beauty of Venezuela. Yes. So I chose your gold backdrop Ooh. and I went and cut these bright pink um, flowers that look kind of tropical that are in a pot on my deck. I displayed them around. I filled the plates as as nicely as I could artistically arranged some uh, avocado on top because I knew that I could focus on that. The avocado is always going to be pretty. I could focus on that even if everything else wasn't photographed. Um, And then uh, filled a couple of extra bowls with accents, brought it all out, put it on, uh, put it in some backlight. And I just went to town. You go wide, you go close, you switch everything. So you have side light, you do a three quarter shot, you do an overhead, you do, I mean, you basically take everything as you can. Um, and then within 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. I opened up my garage door where there was, uh, there was, um, like light coming filtered in through trees. So it was very, uh, contrasty. Mm -hmm. I moved everything. So the light was really where my texture was. I wasn't going to do a lot of of anything else. I moved everything to a wooden, um, backdrop with, uh, 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 again, like strategically. So the light was like right in the right places on the dishes. Mm -hmm. Again, I went very wide. I went very tight. I switched everything. So the light was different. I took, you know, the dishes a different way. I went three quarters. Um, generally I'll always do a shot of people holding it as well. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, 30 minutes I had, I mean, I think I took 150 shots and I kept 40, like 40 shots. (laughs) Yeah. 40 shots is pretty good. And, um, and generally what I will do is I will take the star ingredient of a dish and do some really, uh, just really like find, I don't need to find it cause I have it set up now, like use the good light. And I mean, you can take those ingredient shots in a heartbeat, always spray it with water. If anybody's listening <laughs> and they're yeah. a food photographer, if you have produce spray it with water, it's going to be magic. It can't go wrong. Um, so that's it. That's what I do now. That is amazing, Becky. And um, tell me something about gear, because this is mm. another discussion with mm. uh, a lot of photographers. Mm-hmm. You want the best camera. You mm-hmm. need the best lens. You this mm-hmm. and that. I have some guests in the mm-hmm. Spanish podcast and also in the English podcast, and they surprised me saying like, look, I just use not even a full frame or yeah. I don't have the pro photo lights. Like yeah. when you have the, you know, the creativity and the imagination to make it work, you can make it work. What is your opinion about photography gear? Okay. So, um, I, I have a couple of opinions. First of all, I think if you know and understand light mm-hmm. that overcomes this idea that you have to be like innately creative every photographer needs to just forget that because we're always going to hold it against ourselves. I'm not creative enough. Creativity is overrated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, No light. And if you know light, yes, you can put anything in the right spot and it's going to look gorgeous and it's one shot. And then you take different angles. That's it. Um, And that is true uh, for any any camera. I think, I don't know if you've had, um, Costas Mias. Yes. He's a phenomenal stylist. Mm-hmm. He's a graphic designer by trade. Okay. He went for years with just iPhone. And I, I truly think he puts out some of the best images in the entire food photography community. I mean, I mean, his use of color. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. But again, to people listening, this is all learnable. 
it's all learnable. It's, it's not like this creativity. I feel like we make it like it's this genius that's bestowed on some people and not others, but it's all learnable. That's an aside. That's not an answer to your question. Now, with that said, I mean, does good gear help? Yes, uh, it does. I'm not going to lie. Of course mm. it does. Um, I also think though, like for me, so I am a huge believer that the more you learn with limitations, the better you become. Yes. So again, to go back to a, uh, as a wedding photographer, the entire first year that I photographed, I used nothing but a 50 millimeter lens. That was nothing. my question. Like what was mm -hmm. your gear when you were a wedding photographer? Like, yeah. So I started and I used just that and I had to, so that's a fixed lens. There's no zoom. And I had to adjust my body to make the light work, to make the, um, to, 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 to get to, uh, the vision that I wanted, I had to make all the adjustments physically. And yes. I learned in and out what that, what that lens could do. Yes. Um, so as soon as I started working with my sister-in-law, she had more gear. And so we would share that, um, for the weddings, uh, listen for wedding photographers. I mean, you can't shoot a ceremony in a cathedral and not have a 70 to 200 lens. It's just, I actually don't feel like that's responsible. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not offering your gift guests <laughs> something fair. Um, so I think I fall in the middle. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we said gear didn't matter. Like a 70, 200 lens is always going to look better yes. than, you know, an F4 kit lens. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you know light, yeah, you can, I, I'll everything. put stuff on my stories. Yeah. Like uh, just uh, out of my walks and stuff and people will say, oh, you should put that on your feed. And it's just, it's just, uh, it's just my phone, but I, I saw the light, you know? Mm. So because we, we are, we already talked about your technique or mm. yeah, basically it's light, your, mm. your advice, your great, greatest advice is like, get to know the light, artificial yeah. or natural, whatever. Totally. Here, you know, it's like 50, 50. If you can yeah. afford it, yeah, yeah, of course, go for it. Again, I think it really depends on your type of photography. And it also depends on if you have clients or not, like you do need to deliver a high, if, they, if they're expecting a high resolution photo, you need to deliver that, you yes. know? And again, like if you're a wedding photographer and you can't use off-camera lighting, well, I don't know how you do that in a dark reception. That's that's not that's not fair, you know. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just looking at a good photo, yeah, you can get a photo that looks as good, a hundred percent with them. Amazing. Let's mm -hmm. talk about priorities because mm -hmm. an, a, another topic that I wanted to discuss with you, uh, besides the your particular niche that is being mm -hmm. a podcaster right now, like fully focused mm -hmm. on, you know pushing the podcast to get in, mm -hmm. you know, the right audience and to get to know all these stories through the podcast. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the priorities and social media as a tool mm -hmm. for your niche or your business. I don't trust it. Okay. Period. I would never deny that social media has made quite a few people and it's set the stage for them to have incredibly successful businesses, mm -hmm. but it's a gamble. And for a lot of those people, they got in on the ground floor of a new, a new app or something like that. And the algorithm was kind to them. And that was that. Mm -hmm. The thing about social media is that they, A, will never promise you that if you play by their rules, that they'll reward you. And two, they're constantly changing the rules yes. to whatever is more lucrative for them. So I think it's a gamble to anybody who's starting. With that said, I never could have started the podcast without Instagram as it was at the time, not because of uh, any type of growth or that it rewarded me with like some kind of, you know, phenomenal following, mm -hmm. but because the actual community there was genuinely strong, mm -hmm. giving, curious, and it shared values with me. Yes. So for me as a podcaster, that is how I found most of my guests. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the first early growth for the podcast came from. 
But what happened I would... to the community? What happened to the community? What do you think what is happening right now? Because I feel like there's no community Lonely. anymore. There's not. There's not. Because I think everyone has come to the very, very sad and grudging conclusion that it's not a good use of their time. Mm -hmm. And so if people, you know, are trying to grow, which we all are for whatever reasons, um, we just, we can't really in good conscience put our time on there anymore. Yeah. I have a, yeah. a friend, she said that, yeah, she said, Jessica, Instagram followers are like monopoly, you know, money basically yep. so you can have like 10,000 20,000 sometimes that doesn't guarantee you any work and nope. we have in one of the episodes we have Amy uh, Twigger and then she said yeah I have like 2,100 followers and mm -hmm. I don't have any job at the moment so it's, it is like wow it was hard right. for me to understand that like because she said and the reason is like the brands prefer someone like with less followers, like micro influencers mm -hmm. who yep. can copy the style she perfected. Yeah. And they know the brands, they know that they're going to be cheaper than her. But she said, they don't even approach me to ask my prices. So they just go for the person who is like imitating my style and right. they hire that person. Right. Sad. And honestly, so I'm running into this a lot as I'm looking for podcast uh, sponsors. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I have a couple different ways that people can work with me and I, I will say, so I'm going to say kind of contradictory things. I am shocked mm -hmm. by how few companies are willing to consider podcast sponsorships, mm -hmm. but I'm also just waiting for the day that they are going to wake up and realize nobody's looking at these sponsored posts. One, Instagram's not showing them. And two, when you do see them, you just scroll by. Yes. I mean, I can literally offer many, many times the number, like the just flat out number in my audience, mm -hmm. right? But also when people come to listen to my podcast, they are coming with an open heart. They're coming with an open mind. They trust me. They're hearing something in my voice spoken just to them. And they're not scrolling through distracted by the next post and the next post and the next post. Sponsors don't seem to realize it yet. I am not finding a lot of people that are open to podcast sponsors, but at the same time, I just, I can't imagine that sponsors are going to keep putting out a lot of money for 200 people to mm -hmm. see a post or even 2000 people to see a post as just one of, you know, the next, the yeah. next, the next, the next, the next, the yes. next. Like they might, their eyeballs might literally see it, but are they even, are they even grasping what's, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I just don't see, now TikTok's a whole different world. And personally, I installed TikTok, I think three separate times and was like going to start. And honestly, every time I did, I thought, I don't want to be on this platform <laughs> and I, I, I don't want to be there. And so I'm not going to be because again, it's a gamble. Who's yes. to say that you, could I get 40 million followers? Sure, I could. It's a gamble. I could also waste a lot of time not doing the things that I know will work for growth to take that gamble. And I, I think that Instagram has burned me out on that. I don't do Pinterest anymore. I did it. And then Pinterest started to change everything. And I was like, I am not pouring energy into another platform that's going to just change the rules on me. You're, you're, you're so right. I mean, I decided to join this new platform. Well, it's not, jo no, it's not new, sorry, mm. but it's, uh, it's more like, uh, yeah, let's go to Vero, Vero. Oh, I, Vero. I, I, yeah. I went there. I it's haven't. It's more like a community, but mm -hmm. unfortunately clients are not on Vero. It's mm -hmm. just like people sharing their, you know, their interests. Like if I watch a nice movie or if I listen to a podcast, mm -hmm. so it is more for, you know, sharing interest. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to TikTok and I started like yesterday, like, okay, let's mm -hmm. give it a try. Like just to mm -hmm. see if my podcast or my photos are, you know, mm -hmm. getting the views and stuff like that. But it's a, like a really weird algorithm. I mean, I don't understand it. Well, it's, it probably, and I mean, it's an algorithm, like it's an algorithm. They probably change, they change it to fit their needs. Yeah. Like when I was hacked on Instagram, 
and I lost all of my followers. Um, someone said something to me that I will never forget. Mm -hmm. They said, you have to remember that when it comes to faith, you know, Facebook owns Instagram, when it comes to Facebook, you are not the customer. You are the product. Yes. And a company will pull a product from the shelf mm -hmm. anytime it doesn't serve their bottom line. Exactly. And so the mistake is thinking that we're the customer on these social media platforms. But listen, if we're not paying money, we are not customers. And honestly, we don't deserve to expect that of these companies. No. It'd no. be nice. And it's super unfair when some people get something and you don't. But it's not unfair in the sense that, like, they don't owe me anything. They don't owe anybody anything. So what is your... Uh advice for this for these for all the of those photographers who are starting on a social media like instagram mm. that they have the mm. illusion that they will grow like 10,000 followers because that was the illusion before if you don't get 10,000 followers you are like a nobody mm -hmm. i mean i had that perception and i talked to a couple of photographers and then they said yeah there's some kind of elite that mm -hmm. if you are not on the 10,000 you are like you know mm -hmm. but there's the the other thing For example, I, I know photographers, like famous photographers, they are not busy on their social media because they are busy making money. So exactly. social media is like, okay, they have they need to have like some kind of presence and maybe they are not certified. Maybe they don't have the 10K, but they are excellent photographers and they are making more money probably mm -hmm. than you and me. So exactly. It's a gamble, like you said. It's a gamble. Yeah. So my advice would just be... Uh, decide on a system that works for you yes and then separate yourself emotionally and if your system is don't sign up for any of them that's okay <laughs> <laughs> if your system is post three times a week then make a determination about what you're going to post and just do it and yeah. do not sit there and fret over the timing and the hashtags and the, just do it and move on and uh i think that that will be healthy Yeah. And I, I, as, as for the rest, I think it depends. I think it depends on your niche, right? Like how you mm -hmm. are yes. going to make your money, what you need to do. I do mm -hmm. think everybody needs a community. Yes. I feel a like network. a little bit lost. I, I feel like a little bit lost at the moment because yeah. maybe it, it, it is the end of the pandemic and you know, that was what we kept us all together because we were mm -hmm. from home and then we were mm -hmm. like experimenting and trying to do some photos and sharing mm -hmm. content. And it was like, there was more time. Mm -hmm. And right now, like, you know, everybody's like minding their own business and, and yeah. that's it. Yeah. I feel lucky that I had, I, I, I got in while there was still a community. There wasn't really like, excuse me, me meteoric growth or anything at the time, but mm -hmm. I got in while there was still a community. And I feel like that community continues to like serve me well, but you know, mm -hmm. um, there's other ways to do it. You know, for yeah. me, like my newsletter, it's growing at, mm -hmm you know, between 10 and even some weeks, 50 a week, you know, that is a great way to stay in touch with people. And again, I have their attention when they open that. And my open rate is well over 50%, That's amazing. which is, yeah, like people want to hear about it. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody I got for this upcoming uh, series on like the Christmas around the world series, it was just like asking about it on the newsletter, you know, and some of those turned into bigger episodes. Um, So I think people need a community. I think they need to find a way to do that. Or or I should say, or a network. A network, yes, I think, is important. Network. Because, like, again, for wedding photography, you really don't need a community. You need a network. Mm -hmm. And that depends on how you treat your clients is your biggest network. You know, the people you work with. Yes. Um, Instagram didn't do squat for us uh, for our wedding photography business. No. We barely even had an account. And also, as a photographer, like you found your niche, in this case, mm -hmm. it is the podcast. Um, I always say you, as a photographer, should diversify your business. Like, don't stay in one place. Like, for example, I do a podcast. I have a backdrop uh, web shop. And then... I love. <laughs> <laughs> and then you find, uh, maybe I have a, an online course in Spanish. And then I have this and I have that. And then you will decide, okay, which one is your best, you know, what you fit in the best, because maybe it's not photography, maybe it's teaching, maybe it's like, you know, selling your own products. You know? And Jessica, I have to say, you are a genius at that. And I really admire that. That is not okay. what I'm, I, I really do. That's not what I'm good at. 
It is not what I'm good at. And it's something that I'm like, it's time it's time to push my growth in terms of that direction, in terms mm -hmm. of thinking of these possibilities, trying new things. And yeah, social media, it's, it was just getting, I mean, honestly, it was taking up, I don't even like to think about it, <laughs> but I, I think it breaks. You, yeah. I think it's great. I think it's great. Breaks. Yeah. Unannounced you don't need breaks. to announce. Nobody no. sees it anyways, No. but I, I do. I, I really want to say like, I deeply, deeply, deeply admire you as a businesswoman. I have a lot to learn from you on that front. And I, <laughs> I, I, I hope people too. listening, that's a reason to keep tuning into Jessica's podcast because <laughs> I mean, you really, you, you really are very, very gifted in that. You are. Thank you. Are. I mean, I, I just love the, the way that we can work all together. And mm -hmm. I have, I have something on my website, on my uh, web shop that is called uh, the collapse space. Mm -hmm. And I like to work with artists like emerging mm -hmm. artists that I know they have potential, but they don't have the reach. And I like to work with them. Like, of course, I pay for their art to reproduce them, to give them as a gift to my clients with every order. And, you know, maybe a poster will end up in Australia, in New York, yeah. whatever. And, you know, their, their art is visible. And maybe one day they will mm -hmm. be like, you know, on mm -hmm. those countries doing, you know, performing their arts or, you know, selling their arts. And this is something that I really love to do. I love working with people mm -hmm. together. We can do more than when we are mm -hmm. doing it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things. I appreciate that perspective of, so much. Of the, I have so many ideas, but I don't have time. I also have to. I know. <laughs> I, know. I believe me. I know. And sometimes I don't know how you do it. You have four. I have a really great husband and partner. <laughs> that is also, yeah. I think that is the key. Yeah. That is the key. Yeah, well, Becky, incredible. I appreciate this beautiful conversation. It was like Ron, really honest and with the mm. open heart as you mm. always are. Oh, oh yeah. And... It is always with the open heart. I hope I wasn't too negative. <laughs> no, no, no. Because this, this, this podcast appreciate uh, when mm. people are really honest. I mean, we mm -hmm. have guests in the past that they talk okay how they how they made it in the mm -hmm. end because it's not always like what you see on Instagram that everything is fabulous no no it's and that's what I'm still trying to figure out to be honest with you is how to really make it that's what I'm I do I feel like it's now or never I feel like it's time to We're really make this thing happen yeah We're here or, for that because yeah. maybe someone who's listening is in the same situation like you and me yeah this will clarify, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. No fear. Well, they should listen to you then. <laughs> you're, the, <laughs> you're the business. You're the business mastermind. <laughs> I'm always like telling everybody, like, go for it. Go for it. Go I for love it. it. Go for it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Becky Hadid. I'm going to leave all your info here where you can find her. Her podcast is beautiful. All the stories. I'm so honored to have been here. And I always love talking to you always same you're a good friend thank you okay. all right take care thank Bye. you bye-bye everybody <laughs>